the sheep that is a strong biblical metaphor for the relationship between God and humanity. I've known some people who've raised sheep. In particular, when I uh, served in church in Winterset, Iowa, which is the birthplace of John Wayne and the home, uh, the site of the bridges of Madison County, one of my parishioners who had a couple of sheep told me that sheep were dumb. <coughs> and I think they said that because about once a month or so, he had to leave his job during the day because his sheep had escaped their pasture and were walking down the road near his home. Later I wondered, uh, Later on, I wondered just how really dumb sheep are if they can figure out how to get out of their pasture so regularly. I think that was kind of smart of their sheep. He didn't want to be the next leg of lamb. Shepherding in biblical times was a tough, demanding job required, requiring constant vigilance over the flock. The reason for that vigilance was that the shepherds were paid in sheep. If there was, say, a flock of 100 sheep, they would perhaps get five sheep as their pay, or 10 sheep, when those sheep were sent to market. And the difficulty was that if a sheep or a lamb got lost, got stolen by wolves, or died under the shepherd's care, that sheep, that lamb, was taken out of the shepherd's pay. In Luke's parable of the lost sheep, the reason the shepherd called his friends to rejoice over the finding of the lamb that was lost was that he just regained 20 to 25 percent of his annual income. Get the point? So this image of a vigilant shepherd watching over his flock was a natural one for communicating the image of God watching over God's people. God as caretaker, as shepherd, who guards his flock and cares for it and knows each of them for who they are. Now today, in the, resurrect, in the, in the story from John, which is a pre-resurrection story, John, Jesus confronts the Pharisees in the temple who try to confront him on whether or not that he's the Messiah. And they ask him, and he responds, I told you, I told you, you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness to me. They say whether I'm the Messiah or not. But you don't believe. You won't believe. My sheep bear my name, and I know them, and they follow me. You won't believe because you're not of my sheep. This confrontation, if you read on in the book, almost leads to Jesus being stoned, particularly, probably, in the last comment of the passage where Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Now, in the course of my ministry, I've met a lot of people like those Pharisees in this story. And I must point out that historically, Pharisaic Judaism was not this way, just sometimes they've gotten a bum rap in Scripture. But these are people who, when confronted with truth or miracles or a direction in life that conflicts with their prejudices or comfort, refuse to see and refuse to hear. You know any people like that? That's what I think's going on here. My theology pro professor and friend Clark Williamson once defined sin as willful ignorance. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind is made up. A couple of quotes to help illustrate this point here. Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard once said, there are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true, and the other is to refuse to believe what is true. Think about that. Thomas Edison. 5% of the people think, 10% of the people think that they think, and the other 5% would rather die than think. And then 
one of my favorites from Benjamin Franklin. We are all born ignorant, but one must work hard to remain stupid. <laughs> the Pharisees in this story are that sort of that sort of ilk. They faced are faced with the miracles of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the person of Jesus, and they go on as though they've seen nothing of it. And insisting that they answer their questions, answer that he answered their questions to their satisfaction, which in fact will never be satisfied. Now, the question we have to figure out for ourselves is, how much are we like that? How often do we choose to see reality the way we want to see it rather than the way it is? How, much do, how often do our prejudices blind us to the need for compassion and love for other people rather than the rejection of them? Almost all of the isms in the world, racism, sexism, fascism, consumerism, and even communism and capitalism are philosophies that, if we're not careful, could take us away from the call of Jesus to love God and to love neighbor, our neighbors as ourselves. In one of the great commandment stories, Jesus gives out the great commandments to a person who asks what they are. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And the person comes back seeking to justify himself and, seeing and, say, and saying, well, who is my neighbor? And that's what Jesus tells, tells the story of the great Samaritan, which is one of the greatest anti-racism and anti-prejudice stories in all of Scripture. Now, the people who are closest to the way of Jesus in life are those who follow him. My sheep hear my name, he says, and I know them, and they follow me, and I will give them eternal life. Right after, he says that right after he says to the Pharisees in the scripture, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. And that, matter of following plays right into the final verse of the passage that finally that almost gets Jesus stoned and that's with rocks not with the funny stuff from Colorado he says I and the father are one they accuse him of blasphemy for saying that because he's claiming that he on that basis is God but it raises the theological point that the best way to know God is through knowing Jesus. Jesus is the human example of God in the world. Knowing the stories of Jesus, learning the lessons of Jesus, following the examples of Jesus, seeing in the cross and the re resurrection of Jesus the examples of self-sacrifice self and grace and love, those are the ways to greater understand who God is. And that's the point of following God. That's why the Gospels are so important to the Scriptures, which is God's story. The more we get Jesus into our head and our hearts, the more we could be like Jesus and act like Jesus and follow Jesus' example, the closer we get to being godly people on earth, living in the spirit of eternal life. So my brothers and sisters, in some ways it's good to be sheep. We are God's people, the sheep of his pastor. We just have to do it and really live it. <laughs> Amen. I think the stole can come off now.
Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> We've come out of the world to, to take part in this time of worship. And what we're going to do now is take part in the high point of worship, and that is our time at the table.